Well, good, good afternoon. Um, today's speaker is Mike Lawrence. Mike's uh, a graduate and a PhD from Cape Town University. Uh, after that, he did a postdoc at the LMB in Cambridge, where he worked both with crystallographers and electron microscopists. Uh, Mike is sort of a latent EM specialist. We don't see much of it in the institute at the moment, but some of you will know that Mike's been uh, at the forefront of securing the institute a position in the new molecular electron uh, microscope that's been uh, installed as we speak out at Monash. And for those of you who heard Wilson Wong's uh, talk and spectacular data uh, a few weeks back, you'll realize how important it is for us to have a presence in being able to access this very important technology. So after Cambridge, uh, Mike went back to South Africa for a while before he came to Melbourne. And he came to Melbourne for, well, as a result of an intervention by the same person that got me to Melbourne, and that was someone called Bruce Fraser. Now, who's ever heard of Bruce Fraser before? Who's ever heard of Watson and Crick before? <laughs> So but Bruce Fraser was a student of Rosalind Franklin's working on the DNA structure in the early 50s, and uh, he was looking at her data, and uh, he came out to Melbourne just at about the time the double helix was uncovered uh, from Rosalind's data and Crick and Watson's insight. But Bruce uh, had established structural biology down there at, the, at CSIRO uh, back in the early 1950s. He recruited me there in the late 70s and Mike in the mid 80s. Uh, so Mike and I uh, worked together a little bit over the next decade, but after I came here in 2001, Mike got involved in this program uh, that he's going to tell us about today. The, the so many cell surface receptors fell very easily to crystallographic study that it's hard to know how one should explain the difficulty in getting at this one. And not just at the APO form of the receptor that Mike was instrumental in uncovering back in 2006, but even more so the ligand bound form of the receptor uh, the journals are full of structures of this type and have been over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, but this one has proved especially intransigent, and uh, Mike's going to tell us some of that story this morning. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for uh, that introduction. Um, as Peter mentioned, this uh, project goes back quite a way, and I hope you'll get some sense of that as I, as I give this talk. Uh, could we dim the lights? Thanks. Okay, just to give you a, a quick overview on how I'm going to talk about this, uh, this work. First, I'll give you just an introduction to the structure of insulin, and then I'll lead into what is known about the involvement of insulin and the insulin-like growth factors both in type 2 diabetes, in Alzheimer's disease, and cancer. And that'll be a very, very brief overview, because obviously I'm not a specialist in any of those fields. Um, and then move on to the structural biology itself in terms of what we have discovered. And then finally, um, really some musings about what we might be able to do with, um, with this work. I always like to start the structural biology talk about insulin with going back to this work by um, Dorothy Hodgkin, then Crowfoot, um, in the 1930s, which is showing the very first diffraction patterns of insulin um, to, to appear in the literature. So this is, you must realize, is just um, probably about a decade after the discovery of insulin itself, and a bit more than that after um, the beginnings of X-ray diffraction. But they show these um, rather remarkable pictures, diffraction images of insulin crystals um, for which you can just see, if you look carefully, you can just see a couple of spots poking out beyond the, the beam stop in the X-ray diffraction pattern. But at any rate, Dorothy was able to deduce from this the size of the insulin uh, molecule, which turned out to be the insulin hexamer. 
uh, and that was work published in Nature in 1935. So to jump forward uh, a good number of decades, um, I want to just tell you what the structure of insulin actually turned out to be. Uh, if I can get the movie to run. So insulin consists of two chains, an A chain, which is shown here, a disulfide link within it. Um, the B chain, shown in cyan, is linked to the A chain by another pair of disulfides. You can see the three helices that make up the structure of insulin. Um, in in pro-insulin, there's a link between the B chain point there and the A chain end terminus, and that is cleaved away during processing. Insulin then assembles as a dimer through this anti-parallel arrangement of the, the C-terminal strands of the B chain. And then the whole insulin molecule finally assembles as a hexamer, and hexamerization is mediated by two uh, zinc atoms shown there. And this hexameric form of insulin is that is the form in which it is stored um, within, the, uh, within the pancreas. Um, secretion of insulin then reduces it back to the, the monomeric form in circulation. So that's just a bit of a background to the insulin molecule, and I hope that you can keep the picture in your head as we move forward. So now to come to uh, embedding it into the, the pathway of the talk itself. Um, the relevance of the system to multiple disease states, and I think that this is an area that um, is unfolding um, to, to a greater and greater extent. When you f start off talking about insulin to people, the first thing um, that comes to everybody's mind, of course, is uh, diabetes, and perhaps rightly so, as that is the context in which it was discovered. Um, so di diabetes is an increasingly problematic um, disease and is viewed as a global pandemic. More than 347 million people suffer from diabetes worldwide, with 90% of that being type 2 diabetes. More than 80% of diabetes deaths occur in the developing world at present. And in China, the statistics are actually alarming, particularly when one considers that um, the, the change to increasing change to Western lifestyle within China. So it, based on a, a recent publication, 50% of people in China are judged to be pre-diabetic. So that's really quite alarming. Um, so how does insulin fit into this? Well, this is really um, uh, 101 stuff. Um, that insulin is seen really as the treatment of last resort in diabetes. So this is, a, is an, an approved sort of overall overview of a management pathway from initial diagnosis through to the late stages of the disease. And progression along this all depends on how your blood glucose level is being controlled by the different stages of therapy. So um, ultimately, intensive insulin is where one might end up with type 2 diabetes if these other treatments, such as metformin and sulfonylureas, don't succeed in getting blood sugar under control. So what about insulin in the context of diabetes? Well, at present, there are a variety of insulins on the market that are manufactured by the major manufacturers of insulin. In other words, Nova Nordisk, uh, Eli Lilly, and Sanofi Aventis. Um, and they have marketed a variety of insulin analogues. Uh, and the trade names are listed down on the left. Uh, and listed here are the modifications to insulin that um, these analogues incorporate. So the purpose of these are to try to make the administered insulin mimic that of secreted insulin to a greater extent, not only in um, rate of action, but also in terms of profile of action. So these can be loosely broken into the fast and the long-acting insulins. So these ones would be injected uh, in association with a meal, and these ones are endeavor endeavoring to maintain basal insulin um, background levels. But if you have a look at this, at the modifications that have been introduced into insulin, all of them, without exception, deal with the termini of the B chain, and in particular, the C terminus of the B chain. The C terminus of the B chain is, very, is around about is ResD 30, and these are modifications at 28, 29, plus extensions at 31, 32. Um, and none of those regions of insulin are understood to be involved in receptor engagement. In other words, these modifications are to do with delivery of insulin and with pharmacokinetic profiles, and not at all to do with the way in which insulin binds to its receptor. So that's an interesting point in itself as to why that is, and we'll come back to it later. But we have to ask the question, if we actually understood how insulin bound to its receptor, would we be able to do any different to that? 
And that, that's an interesting question. We'll return. Let's move on to the question of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and this one was rather astounding to me as I began to pick up the literature. Um, over the past few years, there's been increasing recognition of the commonality between Alzheimer's disease and diabetes to the extent that Alzheimer's in some circles is now being referred to as type 3 diabetes. That is quite alarming, and I think it is based on recognition, firstly, of a number of uh, pathophysiological features that are common to the two diseases. It's also recognized that diabetes increases the risk of AD by 50 to 100%. So if you put that into the context of perhaps improving treatment for diabetes, are we looking at um, an increased population of just shifting people from diabetes onto Alzheimer's disease? That's quite frightening. Um, so this, this is a, a paper by Talbot in 2012. Um, which demonstrated for the first time in, in looking at um, post-mortem samples of brain tissue, they were actually able to show insulin and IGF-1 resistance um, at the IRS level um, in, in those tissues. So that is, that's at the very first level of um, post-insulin post and IGF-1 receptor, um, first level into the cell in the signaling cascade. So that, that was um, some quite breakthrough work in that area. And the other thing that is that um, is, is needs to be recognised that in the context of the brain, uh, insulins are doing a, a somewhat different, are fulfilling a somewhat different role to that which they do in peripheral tissue, mainly in the support of uh, of neurons. Uh, and the other thing that is interesting to point out there that the major isoform of insulin receptor that occurs in the brain is different to that in um, in peripheral tissue. So I, I think we have to look at this background as well and ask ourselves about what's going on uh, and how does this all fit together. Uh, and that's something, given the fact that Alzheimer's and diabetes are both relatively complicated diseases, teasing that out is not simple. And I'll point now simply to one aspect that has, um, that has emerged. Uh, and th this is the following. So in type 2 diabetes, type 2 diabetes in itself might lead to insulin brain resistance. In the early parts of the disease, um, when uh, excess insulin is being secreted, that will block or overload, so to speak, the insulin degrading enzyme. So once insulin and insulin receptor are taken up into the cell, insulin gets degraded, the receptor is re recycled to the, cell, the, uh, um, to the cellular membrane. Um, so basically, the insulin degrading enzyme is also known to degrade the A beta peptide that is involved in the neural, uh, the, 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 um, the fibrils that form in the AD brain. So, in other words, if the insulin degrading enzyme is, has got insulin competing with A beta peptide and you've got an ins excess of insulin, you're going to start accumulating A beta peptide into A beta oligomers. Likewise, brain insulin resistance itself has been shown to um, lead to the upregulation of beta secretase and GSK3 beta, both of which are involved then in um, processes that lead ultimately to A beta oligomers as well as to tau phosphorylation. A beta oligomers, in one interesting piece of data, actually, has, has, uh, A beta itself has been shown to bind to. Um, the insulin receptor. And so you might get this sort of feedback loop happening here, a positive feedback loop whereby um, the, the insulin resistance is leading to excess A beta and A beta is driving insulin resistance. But this is not the only process. I just point this out as it's one that's of interest to us. Um, so th this is one of one aspect that might be um, how these two diseases interplay. Um, apart from their um, underlying similarities. So based on, on these sort of ideas, there's a very interesting study going on at the moment that is looking at the administration of nasal insulin as a potential therapy for AD. And I'll, I'll just talk you through some of the, the data here. So this, this is just a pilot um, clinical trial looking at 104 patients with mild cognitive impairment or mild to moderate AD, and they are administered 20 or 40, micro, um, 40, 20 or 40 units of, of insulin uh, intranasally, and I think the period was uh, there, four months. 
Okay, so, and these, the vertical scales here are various scales related to um, trying to assess um, in some sort of qualitative way uh, the decline of um, cognitive ability. So uh, there, this is a decline in cognitive ability, but a, an increase in cognitive ability on 20, a decline on 40, and that's versus placebo. On this particular scale, uh, that's a, a, a decrease in ability compared to um, the administration of insulin. Similar effects there, and also here in the context of AD, less so in the context of mild cognitive impairment. So overall, if you disentangle this data, it's, it really is quite interesting that administration of nasal insulin does appear to be having an effect on the treatment for a, of, uh, on the um, symptoms of AD. So this has been expanded into a much larger clinical trial that's underway at present. Um, so that's interesting in itself. Uh, and of course, uh, this might not be relevant to all the causes of AD. So if we had to um, consider this as insulin as a treatment for AD uh, in certain contexts, one might want to ask the same sort of questions that we were asking before. Well, what type of insulin might be best to, um, to treat AD? Or indeed, given the close relationship with insulin-like growth factors, what if you had to look at that? Um, so there are interesting questions that emerge in that context. The next context is cancer. The cancer one is, um, is, is considerably more established than the Alzheimer's disease context. And the, the, the role of um, insulin-like growth factors in particular in cancer is relatively well established, based on some classical work that um, dates back a few decades now. So you can run through these. Um, based the, uh, one of the, the, the key starting points was that um, the presence of IGF-1 receptor is necessary for the transforming ability of a number of oncogenes. Um, insulin and IGFs can stimulate the proliferation of tumor cells in vivo, uh, and reduction of IGF signaling can lead to reduced tumor growth. And there's also epidemiological evidence that shows um, ins the insulin secretion rate and IGF-1 levels influence cancer risk or cancer prognosis. And you might also interpret from some of this that it might um, interplay into the diabetes context as well. So, okay, so if the insulin-like growth factor receptors are um, intimately involved in cancer, well, can we, treat, can we use them as therapeutic targets? And so this is some work that appeared uh, over the last probably five to six years of a number of companies that set about trying to make monoclonal antibodies that targeted the IGF-1 receptor. And these progressed through to phase three trials. And basically at that point, after a very expensive exercise, the plug was pulled on them. Um, these trials are ongoing uh, in some fashion or other, in combination therapies on smaller populations of patients and so on and so forth. But one has to ask, how did it all get so far that um, a number of candidates fell over at phase three? And there are a whole lot of varieties and fallings on swords, a varieties of excuses and falling on swords that take place to get, to get on top of this. And I will point to just one. This is a fairly obvious slide. Uh, and it, in a sense, it should have been studied more carefully um, before the development of these drugs. And that is that the insulin and IGF-1 receptors actually are very closely related. So these receptors are homodimers, which are typically drawn in this fashion. They are homologous, homologous to the extent that they can form these heterodimers between the IGF-1 receptor and the two isoforms of the insulin receptor. This is the brain one, by the way. Um, and not only can they form these homodimers, disulfide-linked homodimers, but they can also bind all three ligands within the system. And the outcome of signaling is, is rather complex as to whether you head into metabolic signaling outcomes or mitogenic signaling outcomes. So clearly, if you came along with an antibody that targeted um, this molecule, you might well expect that um, it's going to be pretty easy for the system to um, evade that. So I think it was not surprising, and it should have been studied perhaps in more, uh, with more care as to what exactly was going on and, and what the efficacy might be. So, of course, that raises a question as well. Well, what if we understand these events of insulin binding to insulin receptor and how the IGFs bind to the IGF receptor? Um, would we be able to tackle this problem in a better way? 
as I say, that's only one aspect. You could point to a whole lot of other issues with the clinical trials. Um, but here is an interesting, one to, interesting point to start. OK, let me move on to the second part of my story. So that's, um, that's really just a sort of clinical background as to the role of the insulin receptor in, um, in these three disease states. OK, so now I'm going to, to shift gear entirely and move on to the structural biology. So as I mentioned to you, these receptors are disulfide-linked homodimers. And I'll just talk you through very simply what the structure of these proteins is. It consists of a variety of three of six domains in the extracellular region over here, a leucine-rich repeat, a cysteine-rich, another leucine-rich repeat, and then three fibronectin domains shown here in green, orange, and, and mauve. And then here are the intracellular domains. Um, in the second fibronectin domain, there is the, the, alpha, the cleavage site between the alpha and beta chains. And this little point that I've starred here is the C-terminal segment of the alpha chain that is actually quite critical for insulin binding. So when insulin binds to its receptor, it actually cross-links um, two sites on the receptor. The first site is made up of the L1 domain on the first monomer and the C-terminal peptide of the alpha chain, the star, on the second monomer, as well as a second site that is um, probably between the first and second fibronectin uh, type 3 domains. So that's looking at it from the receptor. In terms of insulin, um, the site 1 surface is understood to involve residues mainly drawn from the dimerization surface of insulin that I've talked about before, whereas the site 2 is involved in residues drawn from um, the hexamerization surface of insulin. Uh, and the other point to make is that clearly there's another symmetric site sitting across here that I've not shown. And the reason I've not shown it is that um, insulin binding to site 1 and 2 is supposed to, is, is evidence to show that it is negatively cooperative with respect to insulin cross-linking the symmetric opposite pairs of sites. Uh, so that's the understanding of insulin binding. I would point out here that insulin is really quite a small molecule, and we, we're assigning it more and more tasks. It's not only got a, hex, it's not only got a hexmerize within uh, the, the domain of the pancreas. When it binds to a receptor, it has to disassemble. It will be disassembled and then have to concoct two further sites to, in order to do this cross-linking. And there's only so much surface available to a small molecule. So I think, in this sense, this is perhaps not surprising that... Um, you know, it will utilize the same surfaces that are involved in insulin oligomerization are going to be the same surfaces that are involved in um, receptor binding, to a point. Okay, so as Peter pointed out, to study the structural biology of the system is not straightforward. Uh, and there are a variety of reasons for that, uh, and I'll just run through them briefly. Firstly, the receptor is highly glycosylated. Uh, so... My sort of rule of thumb is that if you've got one sugar to every 50 residues, you've got problems in crystallization. If you're getting around about one to every 100, you're probably heading into the feasible realm. Well, the insulin receptor is definitely in the round of the one to 50 range. Um, it is problematic. There are an enormous number of sugars attached. So if you imagine a molecule with all of these mixed glycans coming out from the surface, uh, a molecule like that doesn't like to pack into a crystal. It's easy to pack into crystals things that are rigid, things like enzymes. Um, but if you're talking about a floppy receptor with sugars on it, and as many sugars as this, it's going to be hard. <coughs> Excuse me. The other aspect is the number of disulfide bonds within the insulin receptor homodimer, in particular within the cis-rich region and the disulfides that link the, um, the, the various protomers together. Uh, trying to make a molecule like that and to get it correctly folded takes care. It cannot be done, for example, in E. coli. Uh, so if you take all due care and you set up stable mammalian cell culture to produce these things, the yields are going to be abysmal, of about 0.3 to 2 mg per litre. And then if you're talking about needing tens of mg to, to, to set yourself down a crystallization pathway, uh, it becomes expensive. And then if you have to design constructs on top of that, it becomes yet more expensive. Uh, We've also adopted the approach that to get the adequate purity out of this, the best way to purify it is through um, ligand or uh, tag affinity chromatography using monoclonal antibodies, and that is uh, expensive in itself. To overcome the question of these issues of the glycans, uh, 
one way to do it is to attach monoclonal antibodies, uh, the, the, the FAB fragments of monoclonal antibodies to the protein. And that itself takes um, time and care. Then, as I pointed out, the, the structure is, is highly flexible. Uh, it's got all this, these domains associated with it, and that's going to cause you problems. Plus the fact that if you're trying to load up something that's got negative cooperativity, you might just never know what stoichiometry you've got in the context. So all of this points to is really these are the reasons um, why this project has taken so long. Okay, but nonetheless, uh, in 2006, when I was still at CSRO, um, we did have a breakthrough, uh, and that's the point that CSRO decided they'd had enough and it was time for the project to come to Weihai. Uh, so this is the picture that we got on the left, um, showing the insulin receptor as a homodimer that has an inverted V or lambda conformation. Uh, let's start somewhere. In the foreground, I've shown one monomer in ribbon representation, and in the, in the background is the second monomer in surface representation. And if you just, you can follow through the same domains that I showed you earlier, the L1 domain, the cis-rich, the L2, and then the three fibronectin legs. The yellow one, three fibronectin domains. The yellow fibronectin 2 domain, uh, one of its strands, the C strand, exits over here and then heads up onto this mauve piece here, which is that I had star in the earlier structure. And that's this alpha-CT peptide. And then at some point, um, the structure resumes, makes the rest of the fibronectin domain, makes the, the lower fibronectin domain, and enters the membrane before going through to the tyrosine kinase domain and the ductus membrane segment. Uh, and we showed in, 19, uh, in, in a paper in 2010 that we, we managed to get some insight into the, the structure of this alpha-CT segment, as we didn't resolve it clearly in the earlier work in 2006. And we showed that it was a helix sitting on top of the L1 surface, um, interdigitated onto that surface through a pair of, of uh, phenylalanine residues. And the association of these two make up what is called site one, or the primary insulin binding site. So somehow, you need both of these elements for, any, for insulin to bind. Uh, insulin will not bind to either separately. Site two, well, if you imagine then, site two must be close to that and the, the most logical points seem to be the junction between the opposite pair of fibronectin domains. So that's the, the evidence that we had for site two, which is not a great deal. Uh, but that, that was a major piece of work um, to get it that far and really spanned about 15 years of endeavor at CSRO. Uh, we also crystallized this with four FAB molecules attached, which I've not shown here at all. But nonetheless, uh, it told us one thing, two things, sorry. It told us two things. FABs were definitely the way to go. We'd not got any crystals of this receptor that diffracted at all well without FAB attachment. The second thing that it told us was that this alpha-CT segment that we'd never really understood before was absolutely critical to everything that was going on. And so um, when I brought the project here to Weihai, those are the two aspects I sought to focus on. One was FAB attachment, and the other was to sink all of our resources into trying to understand this question of site one assembly and the role of the alpha CT peptide. As we, we'd rather, as we hadn't understood it at all, it was not obvious how this peptide, so remotely located from L1, 900 residues, sorry, about 700 residues downstream, together with this one at the end terminus, how they could assemble to form an instant binding site. That we had not understood at all. Okay, so what did we set about doing? Well, it's clearly futile to work with the whole receptor. You'll never crystallize that. Um, it's way too floppy, and it's got the transmembrane anchors. I've talked about the insulin receptor ectodomain, where you only look at the intracellular part. We've managed to get that structure. And then there were these handful of literature constructs um, that we'd begun to work on up the road, but uh, hadn't really made much progress. And we decided when the project came here that we would really focus on trying to work out what was going on with these, because all of these could bind insulin with, with uh, a decreasing affinity. It didn't seem to matter where you put this alpha-CT peptide, whether you put it covalently at the end of this construct or you added it in exogenously to those. Now, based on that structure that I showed you that we got in 2010, um, adding exogenous peptide becomes sort of obvious. Um, all you need, in effect, is L1 and the peptide. L1, unfortunately, by itself has a large hydrophobic patch where the cysteine-rich region joins onto it, and so we couldn't make that. 
we had to somehow aim to make this piece. Those of you who came to a talk of mine a few years ago um, across the road when we were giving lectures there, Wednesday talks there, I described a structure of this fragment, uh, which is really very large uh, in complex with insulin, and we just got that at the time. Um, it turned out we couldn't improve those crystals, and we then chain and we couldn't get the work published either. So we then headed on to that one. So that's sort of the the, um, the time history of this. We wanted to work with this with this construct. Making that construct was not easy. Um, it failed, and when we looked at the literature, it was clear that the people in the literature, which was Nova Nordisk, that were trying to do it, were also having problems. And our breakthrough was really to hit upon this strategy. We knew from earlier work with Tom, that Tom Garrett had done that we had a structure for these three domains um, and that they produced quite happily. So the idea was if we put a cleavage site between the cis-rich and the L2 domain, we could make hopefully buckets, so to speak, of this and then um, cleave it with uh, thrombin, put an FAB on it, add in the peptide, add in insulin and head into crystallization trials. Uh, that was the overall strategy that we came up with. Now, none of that is, is trivial. If you look, if you walk your way through um, just what has to be done, both in terms of generating the cells in the first place, um, through to the actual protein chemistry involved, and ultimately down to crystallization, this, this is really a, a Herculean task to get that far. And I, I'm indebted to the people in my lab, uh, May Margetts and John Menting in particular, for um, driving all this work um, through. So we got down and eventually we managed to get a crystal structure of the fragment. And that is shown here. So here is the L1 domain, which is a beta barrel. The cysteine rich is a rather convoluted structure coming up here. It sort of exits and folds around the hydrophobic surface of L1. And sitting on top of the L1 domain is indeed the alpha CT peptide in a helical conformation. And then the two chains of insulin, the A chain in gold and the B chain in black. It was actually very surprising when we saw that because uh, the alpha chain is not in contact with the receptor, with the L1 at all. In fact, it's sitting mainly engaged with the alpha CT peptide. The beat chain of insulin is sitting on the very edge of the sheet. And so when you look at this complex, it's immediately clear as to why alpha CT is absolutely critical to what's going on. The binding site hardly exists without the alpha-CT peptide. And I think that was particularly comforting because that was where we were focusing our effort, was on trying to understand that peptide. Uh, and I said, I'm not showing the FAB. It was attached to the cis-rich region in an innocuous fashion over here. Here was the second surprise, and that is that the alpha-CT peptide had completely changed conformation on the surface of L1. Um, you probably didn't see it in the earlier one because it wasn't showing the same view. But in the APO structure, uh, the alpha-CT peptide is shown here in yellow, and it sits at about 45 degrees to the surface of L1, so to speak. In this one, the complex, it's in a perpendicular arrangement. Not only that, it's not only rotated, it's also translated and reorganized. So here, it stopped at 710, even though the, the C-terminus is residue 719, here, an additional turn goes on, and it goes on to 715. So 710 is back here somewhere. The other side actually unwinds. Um, so from 693 to 705, it completely unwinds, and we don't see that at all. Um, so that was surprising, and what was all that about? Um, well, we don't know. It was perhaps anticipated in some way because John Menting had measured, using ITC, had measured the affinity of this peptide for the surface and discovered it to be um, a, uh, in the low micromolar range, about, uh, I think, 10 uh, micromolar. Um, so clearly there was scope for this peptide to move. And indeed, we knew something had to happen because there were critical residues past 710 that we believed were in critically involved in insulin binding, and yet we didn't see them in the APO structure. So all of this makes sense, and I could show you a lot of data that would support that view. I'll come back to some of that later. The third surprise was this, and that is that we couldn't see the B chain C-terminal end at all of insulin. So if, here's the helix in black of the insulin B chain, and if I took insulin in the conformation that I presented at the beginning of the talk, 
the B chain C terminal strand will head down this way. That's residue 24, the black one, the other black one is residue 25, that would be 30. And if you overlay this with, uh, into a, a, a different view, uh, with the electron density associated with the alpha CT peptide, what you can see is that these were just hopelessly interdigitate. Uh, and a lot of our effort was involved in persuading the referees that what we were seeing here was real, um, that this had to be displaced outwards, and the interpretation of this density was correct. And you can see here that residue 710 and 714 critically poke into the core of insulin. I'm not showing in that view, not showing the A-chain. So that was surprising. Uh, and and we, we sort of coined that as being the sort of molecular handshake that's going on. The insulin receptor, the alpha-CT peptide is rotating, insulin is unfolding and the, the, uh, the, as the molecule docks. And that would be the first stage. So this is the work we published in Nature towards the beginning of last year. Uh, and I'm now going to go on to a couple of other things, like what did we decide to do after that? Well, there were a lot of things we would like to do. Firstly, the resolution was absolutely miserable. Uh, it was 3.9 angstroms, and we had to, argue to, the, to argue with the referees that it wasn't five angstroms. Um, so that was a bit difficult. Um, but if we believe the structure, uh, and there's lots of reasons for believing it, uh, we could start to ask a lot of questions. Can we look at other insulins bound to the receptor? Can we look at IGFs bound to the insulin receptor? What about, if we now believe we've got a strategy for understanding site one, can we shift over to the homologue, the IGF-1 receptor, and start asking the questions about how insulin might bind to that, or how IGFs might bind to that? And then what about the next part of the story, site two binding? If we can, can we progress these structures into some sort of strategy to tackle site two, about which so little is understood, and hopefully this would give us a handle onto the next stage, which is what happens to the receptor in terms of conformational change that finally leads to signal transduction. So there's lots to do based on that structure. So this is the first thing we did, we, we, and we, this is ongoing work. We are trying to improve the resolution of those crystals. We managed to get it out to 3.3, and we published this work in PNAS a, a couple of months back. Uh, and basically what that shows is that here's the B-chain in black, with the B-chain helix in black, with the C-terminus of the B-chain helix over there. We were able to resolve, shown in green here, or the equivalent view over there, we were able to show how the B-chain C-terminal strand actually heads along the L1 surface. And there were various reasons we couldn't see that in the, the earlier work that we published. Interestingly, it ducks under. This is, this is the alpha CT segment in mauve. It sort of ducks under it, and the CT segment heads upwards at that point. I'll come back to that later as well. This is the A chain in ter C terminus here in yellow. Residue B24 is one that's been extensively studied in the context of insulin binding. This sits in a remarkable pocket that's formed by alpha CT, the B chain helix, and the L1 surface, and the, L, the A chain uh, C terminus on top. So that's really tucked into this pocket over here. Uh, and that's really interesting um, because we're looking at, we, we, um, we have some work that has uh, looked at substituting the B24 with both non native amino acids and with um, every native amino acid and trying to look at the effect of what that has on insulin binding. So this. What's, to, to give you a different view of what's happening here, if you look at this image, this is the, in, in black and in brown is the B chain of insulin in its native state, in its receptor-free state. And what has happened is that it's folded out into this green conformation here through a little bit of a turn, a, a little bit of a rotation of this um, type 1 beta turn here, and then a much larger rotation and swinging out in a hinge-like motion of that strand away from the insulin core. And this is looking at a side-on view to show you it's more or less all in plane. And here's the same thing again, but overlaid um, on top of the alpha CT and giving you a more three-dimensional view. And what you can see happens is that residue 24 stays more or less in the same place, but there's a rotomeric change. So moving the C alpha from that point to that point, there's a, a rotomer change of the residue that keeps the side chain more or less in the same place. But... Um, Tyrosine 26, which is right in the heart of the insulin core, 
goes way out as a result of this 50 degree rotation. It goes way out, and these two alpha CT residues, 710 and 714, they embed into the insulin core in place of the tyrosine 26. So in fact, there is actually a third surface of insulin involved in receptor binding. Apart from the dimerization surface, also involved is the core of insulin itself. So that's intriguing. Insulin disassembles to bind its receptor. Okay, so that's one thing that we've been doing. The other thing that's been on our mind, and I think on the mind of some of our referees as well, and that is clearly working with the, the, the fragment, the so-called microreceptor, uh, L1CR plus alpha-CT. Working with that is completely different to working with the whole receptor. So is any of this um, artifactual? So we generated this structure. We managed to crystallize um, the L1CR fragment with alpha-CT alone, no insulin bound. And that's this diagram here on the left. So in the green is the way we see that segment in the aporeceptor ectodomain structure. That's in the context of the entire V. In yellow is how we see it in the context of no ligand on the L1CR fragment. And you can see they're actually very close together uh, in, in fit. And then in mauve is how we see it in the insulin, compl in the insulin complexed microreceptor structure. So this is saying that um, we can recapitulate the conformation of the alpha-CT peptide in the context of the microreceptor. So the yellow structure actually provides a, um, a link, a vital link between the larger structure in APO form and the insulin-bound structure in the um, truncated form. This is just um, a prelude to some other work that we're doing, is that showing you how in the APO form, the two phenylalanine, seven, uh, the two phenylalanine residues 701 and 705 <coughs> embed into a deep pocket on the surface of the, um, the L1 uh, module. And that's quite interesting for us. I'll come back to that. Okay, so that's, uh, that's something else that we've done and hoping to publish soon. The other aspect that I've mentioned to you is that of um, FAB complexation. FABs are wonderful things. They're quite big, and you, uh, um, and you just put them onto the molecule, and that way you sort of extend the molecule outwards, and you extend them outwards to such an extent that the sugars are no longer problematic or no longer nearly as problematic to um, crystallization. You're introducing protein for crystal contacts rather than the sugars. Uh, but in a sense, they've got problems, uh, and these have been well known for, for quite a while. Namely, that an FAB consists of two domains, FV and F an FC domain, with a structural hinge in between, which more or less restrains them to a one-dimensional motion, uh, a rotational motion about that hinge. This, is, this brown blob is the antigen binding site. So uh, what happens is you, you've still got quite a gross measure of conformational flexibility upon, FV at, um, upon FAB attachment. And in a number of our crystals, we don't actually see the FC domain at all. It's completely disordered. So it's sort of in multiple conformations within the, the crystal lattice. Uh, so something that we've been pursuing is, well, what if we just made the FVs? Uh, they're also just a bit bigger than uh, the sugars. And if we could put FVs on, that would give us another repertoire of uh, another means of modifying the structure with a propensity to aid crystallization. But basically, they're not easy to make, um, in, certainly in uh, bacterial systems. So um, we cottoned on to the following. And um, uh, my thanks to May Margetz in my lab, who really pioneered this work uh, to get it established. And it's proving remarkably um, successful, except it doesn't work all the time, but certainly compared to anything we've tried in E. coli, it streaks ahead. And that is to express this, uh, these proteins in the so-called Brevi bacillus system. So Brevi bacillus is a, is a gram-positive bacterium um, and is able to secrete proteins into the media if they are, are tagged with the appropriate peptide. And it secretes relatively few proteases into that medium. So it, it provides a way of getting soluble production of proteins um, in, a, in a, relatively simple, a relatively simple fashion. And so what we have done with this is to um, clone the VH 
component, that's the, 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 the heavy chain component of the FV domain, into one uh, uh, bacterium, and then the VL into a second, and you grow the two up independently, and then you simply spin down the supernatant to remove the cells and mix the two media together, and with an affinity tag, you can go, oops, sorry. With affinity tag, you can um, pull out the FV fragments. So there's a tag on one of these, and that's the FV that's being pulled out there, those two components. And you can see the level of it. These are Kamasi gels from the medium itself. You can see there are relatively few proteins. And here you can see the large overexpression uh, of the VH and VL as secreted into the medium. So uh, th this technology for producing FVs is actually um, quite spectacular, I think, and is proving um, successful. So gradually, we, we have arranged to sequence all of our, our um, monoclonal antibodies and then to um, go into FV production. Uh, and we've had some preliminary success with that. Um, so what has happened here is um, John Menting has attached an FV fragment to the L1CR um, construct. Uh, here's insulin and um, alpha-CT. And attaching it in this way, you can actually then deglycosylate the protein with um, endoH, and the whole thing remains soluble. Uh, we have found before that using deglycosylation reduces solubility, but here is a system that we now believe um, has advantages over the earlier one where we had the disordered um, constant domain at the back end of that. So we're pursuing that at present. Um, to move on, um, this is another one we're pursuing now, and this is where I was heading, telling you about how we can put on IGF-1s onto the same system. So here we've got the piece of the insulin receptor. We've actually put on the peptide from IGF-1 receptor. So this is really a model of the, um, of the heter of IGF-1 binding to the heterodimeric insulin receptor IGF-1, the hybrid insulin receptor IGF-1 receptor. So this is work in progress as well. So we're tidying that up too. Um, Another strand that we're pursuing, uh, as Peter alluded to, uh, and we've got some funding to do this, is looking at the extra domain structure of IGF-1 receptor that um, is a good mimic of the whole receptor and trying to look at it by single particle uh, electron microscopy. But that's proving quite hard. We've got some indication of ligand binding in here, uh, some differences. You can see the resolution is not crash hot. And these are based on CCD images obtained uh, in Germany and we're really hoping through the course of the next year to move this on to um, direct, electro, direct electron detector technology as it becomes available to us. Okay, to head, um, to head on to very briefly to the third part of my talk, and that is the scope for therapeutic improvement. Um, okay, uh, insulin analogs. I've talked about insulin analogs, and I have to say they're controversial, mainly because they, whereas they offer better management they're not actually, at the end of the day, better insulins. They have changed the, um, they, they have changed the pharmac uh, pharmacokinetics of insulin. They're not actually changing the insulin, insulin receptor interaction themselves. Um, okay, so another aspect uh, that our colleagues in Case Western Reserve University are looking at is the thermostability of insulin. And the logic there is that, um, in the third world context in particular, um, the there's an issue of cold storage of insulin um, in, in villages, et cetera. And insulin is not entirely thermostable. And you can imagine some sort of pathway um, that Mike's drawn here, um, showing that these off pathway, off pathway in terms of receptor binding, insulin can actually unfold. If as that beta, beta mole strand comes out, that actually becomes in amyloid, involved in amyloid formation. And so there's a problem with insulin storage um, in that context. And um, my, Mike has a company that's involved in trying to generate um, more thermostable insulins. So really, the, the question of improving insulin is, um, is a moot point because you might say that nature has done that optimally. Um, but I believe that Nova Nordisk, for example, has mutated every single amino acid of insulin to every other single amino acid of insulin and tried to look at their properties of that. Nobody has that data, but I believe it's in-house. 
Um, so presumably nothing has come of that. Uh, it's obvious that some mutations will lead to mitogenic outcomes, particularly if insulin begins to mimic IGF-1. Um, so how, how could one expand beyond this? Well, the one way is to look at non-native changes to, to insulin. Um, so the sort of things that are being pursued, and we're working with people who are doing these at the moment, is the replacement of the insulin disulfide bonds with dicarbo bonds, which are somewhat more rigid, going back to single-chain insulins, which would help to stop amyloid formation through um, the, the B-chain C-terminal region, and also non-native amino acid substitutions. Um, and, and we're doing co-crystal structures of, of these at present. Um, in terms of insulin and AD, well, that's all at the same at an early stage. Uh, it's not something we're actively involved in at all. But we have to ask ourselves the question, well, if insulin does indeed emerge as a therapeutic for AD or indeed IGF-1, what type of insulin would it be? Would it require a different analog, bearing in mind that it's, um, bearing in mind it's a different type of insulin receptor? It has a different alpha-CT peptide in that particular isoform. The other thing that we're looking at is going back to this picture of showing the two phenyl alanines which anchor the alpha-CT peptide onto the L1 surface. It's known, and I won't go into the details of that, that if you can strengthen this interaction, you can actually um, inhibit ligand binding. So we're looking at this in the context of small molecules, and this is some work that um, Callum Lawrence is doing in my laboratory uh, of uh, trying to analyze some, some lead compounds that we got from a screen. Uh, run at Bandura. So that might have um, impact within the cancer context um, if one was looking at inhibiting both IR and IGF-1R and overcoming the problems with monoclonal antibodies. So that uh, is basically a tour both of the, um, the diseases that I think insulin receptor is involved in, what we're trying to do with the actual structural studies themselves, and really just some musings about um, how this work might actually have impact into these three rather large and uh, complicated disease states. There are many people to thank. Um, if I can just run through them briefly in the last minute or two that I've got. Obviously, the people in my lab, uh, uh, Peter Common, uh, just sort of has been instrumental together with Colin Ward from day one in CSRO in taking the leap to get this, published, this um, problem uh, th this project underway, uh, and, and really I think the, the foresight of Colin in particular and his stoic ability to, um, to stick with it over what is now almost two and a half decades is, is incredible. And my lab members for signing up for something that is as difficult as this and as crazy as this, um, I, I must congratulate them as well on their success. We've managed to pick up collaborators on the way. Um, Mike Weiss is... is I would say is the world expert on the structure of insulin itself. And we've published now a number of papers together with Mike and his input has been absolutely invaluable. Brian, of course, comes from here. Uh, he has done a lot of modeling work with us and together with, now together with Mike. Uh, his input also is invaluable. The crew at CSRO, uh, even though the project has left CSRO, we're still critically dependent on them for many things, in particular the work done on large-scale mammalian cell culture, the work done in EM, and also the crystallization work in C3. The EM work was done at uh, the MPI in Martins Reed. We had a collaboration with the group in York that was tied up with Nova Nordisk at one point in time. They have some novel insulins together with a group in Prague. Um, that we published together with them in Nature. Don Steiner uh, has just retired recently in his mid-80s. Don was the person who discovered the um, biosynthetic pathway of insulin, and his input into all of our work here has been invaluable too. Um, and then there, there's other people that we hire that um, should not be overlooked at all. The grants office, who've been of enormous assistance to us over the years to get money from um, people who give it like to give us money. Uh, the BDO, um, clearly setting up all these collaborations, getting reagents, et cetera, et cetera, um, takes time and effort in terms of MTAs um, and, and the like, and I'm indebted to them as well. The antibody work for uh, producing the MABs that we finally cleave into FABs, um, for my thanks to Kay and Paul for contributing to that. And then down the bottom are the, the obvious people, uh, institutions that fund us too. Um, my, um, my absolute gratitude to WeHi for taking this problem on from CSRO as would have been a tragedy 
for it just to have been um, lost uh, in 2007. Um, the NHMRC has been very generous to us in terms of funding, and none of this could have happened at all without the, um, having the Australian synchrotron sitting on our doorstep. Thank you very much. Uh, I have, sorry, I have one last slide that I missed, and that is that I want to dedicate this talk to um, an ex-colleague of mine, um, is Neil McKern. Neil was instrumental in getting this done at CSRO and instrumental in getting the projects up and running here at Weehai. And Neil tragically passed away from uh, multiple myeloma earlier this year. Uh, Neil was a great friend and colleague of, of many of us here. So I, I do dedicate this talk to Neil. Thank you. Actually, the, what actually triggers Alzheimer's in the first place, where there are two, two things that are just mutually reinforcing each other, um, is an open question. And I think there's also, I mean, you have to look at Alzheimer's, there's probably more than one cause. Um, there's I mean, not the cause in, in genetic, and it's a genetic reason for Alzheimer's. Um, but in the sporadic form of the disease, um, I think that's a, it's, it's a moot point. But, um, but nonetheless, the, the phenomenon of insulin resistance in the context of Alzheimer's is now clearly established, as, as are the, um, the multiple similarities and pathways that are involved in both diseases. So I don't think we can look at it totally in terms of cause and effect, but rather just in terms of, um, of, of the positive feedback between those events. But any, any insulin resistance measured on Alzheimer's brain tissue would be done on a high level. It's a very stage. Yes, that's true. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Mike, beautiful, beautiful work. Um, I just go, I'm intrigued by the unfolding of the peptide <clears throat> as it binds to the receptor. Um, what happens to the disulfide ones? Are they retained as, as in folds? And second sorry, part of that... Sorry, sorry, to clarify, you mean the, 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 the in, disulfides in the peptide? The disulfides in the peptide. In, in insulin? It's the insulin peptide. So as the insulin peptide B chain unfolds. Right, right, okay. And, no. and, and just a second part quickly to that, then, if you're looking to thermostabilise insulin, wouldn't you suggest that that would then inhibit that process of unfolding, and you'd get a, a, a actually you'll start to make the peptide unable to bind the receptor. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, now, as far as we can tell, and admittedly the resolution is limited. There's little, if any, change in the disulfide bond conformation. So those disulfides are all within the core of the molecule, and are not involved. They are the, the first, well, the, the furthest C-terminal disulfide in. Um, in the B chain is at residue 19, I think. So we're talking about residues 24 onwards unfolding. So they're not affected. Um, however, we are limited by resolution. And I, I, it's a very interesting point, and we're trying to pursue it at the moment. And I think that what we see is that in the insulin structures that exist as free insulins in the database, there is a repertoire of um, disulfide conformation. And we're certainly within that repertoire. But the repertoire seems to be clustered. And we're trying to understand that at the moment. Um, just as a follow-up to that, um, some of the new data you showed on the, the insulin beta C-terminus sort of tucking in and snaking up behind things. 
Um, so how, does that provide some explanations for some of the beta chain C terminal analogs and mutations like in the paper that you suggested for the students to read ahead of time? So is that giving us some new Absolutely. Um, the interesting thing about that paper was <coughs> that um, they, they were looking at mutations at, and truncations around about RISD-25. And I think they concluded that it all happened from um, from 24 onwards. Um, but here we see 24 actually stays much in the same place. There's not much conformational change up to 24. And it all happens from 25 onwards. Um, so that was that was the surprising that was the surprising thing. Two quick ones, Andres. So, Mike, you, you mentioned that uh, you're using uh, dimers of VH and VL fragments to try and uh, help crystallization, and that this is uh, sometimes not easily done. So I remember that camels and related animals make single chain antibodies. So would there be a possibility of using fragments from single chain antibodies from, from camels or related animals to help them? It's a very good point. Um, in principle, yes. Um, I, I have one slight reservation. Uh, we've never tried it, probably just due to laziness. Um, but I think that uh, I have, do have one reservation in that I think that those, the way those, um, the camelids or the, and the shark antibodies are structured is that they have a very large um, CD3 loop that typically penetrates into um, crevices. So the, the, the normal antibody, so to speak, has typically got a groove between the VH and VL and, um, and binds to an epitope in that fashion. The camelid ones have a protrusion um, that binds um, into grooves and pockets. And I'm just a little bit cautious, I think, when I look at the structure, the obvious grooves are going to be points that would inhibit instant binding. So I, I was just sort of steering away from that. The 8371 one binds so nicely in a convex to concave fashion on the outside of cis rich. I would hate the, a camelid, spend the time generating a camelid antibody and discover that it binds in the groove between CR and L1. So that's just probably my caution, but I'll take your point. John, this is a follow-up question to what was asking over there. You drew our attention to the crystal structure of the hexameric ligand. Uh, does a conformational change in insulin potentially affect the hexamer? Uh, it's difficult to know because you're only ever... Right, so in the, in the hexamer, the, the, B chain, the B chain is folded, the B chain C chain is, is folded right up against the core and residues 24 and 25, 24 and 26, the two aromatic residues, plug into the core of insulin. Uh, that's exactly as it is in free, the free monomer, or so we believe. Um, and uh, th therefore, the insulin in its receptor-bound conformation is entirely incompatible with um, binding, entirely incompatible with its conformation in the hexamer. <laughs> and indeed, if you look at those analogs, the, the ideas of the analogs are either to stabilize the hexma, in other words, to lead to long-acting insulins, or to destabilize the hexma to achieve a rapid-acting insulin. So that it's, it's critically tied with that story. The very last one. Oh, thank you, um, Mike, thank you for a brilliant introduction to, you, to a very complicated story. I, I'm sure you've probably told us this, but where are the extra residues that are found in the brain receptor? And what's your prediction as to how that those extra residues or loss of residues um, might change the signal? It's a fascinating question. I hope somebody would pick that up because I sort of missed that thread. So the, the difference between the two isoforms are that the CT peptide is longer in the peripheral tissue insulin, the so-called B isoform. It's got an additional 12 residues, if I'm not mistaken, at the very end of the C terminus. So the shorter ones, um, the shorter one is found in the, almost exclusively in the brain tissue, and it's also a fetal isoform, um, fetal abundance. That form, because it is shorter, can bind the IGFs with higher affinity. So that all makes sense because um, if you looked at the pictures, 
you'll see that the C-terminus of the peptide, in effect, will thread through an IGF, where the IGF is, is a single-chain molecule. It threads through a loop as the B strand carries on to join up with the A helix. So possibly part of the way in which the um, receptors discriminate between um, the IGFs and insulin is through this mechanism of having a longer or shorter C-terminal peptide. It's probably not the only mechanism. But if you understand that, that um, the shorter one has a higher propensity for IGF binding, then that concurs entirely with the malaria in which you would find the shorter IRA isoform, namely in fetal growth, upregulated in fetal growth, and in, in, a, um, in a capacity of neuronal development. So I think those are the distinctions, um, whereas in the peripheral tissue, um, you're simply wanting the insulin affinity to exist. The interesting thing allied to that is that in, in the cancer context, it's the IRA isoform that's believed to be upregulated, and that's precisely the one that has um, affinity for IGF-1 and signals metabolically. So I think we've, we've got a, at least a hand-waving under, understanding of the role of the two isoforms that seems to concur with the structural biology.